Very good evening to everyone. Uh, now as the cataract surgery results are improving, our techniques are refining, technology is improving, there are various IOL options that we have. Uh, time is now more and more moving with patients coming us to us with options. For example, when patients come to us in the clinic and we advise them that you need a cataract surgery in a month or two, the first question that they shoot back to us is that which IOL will I have? Will I have that expensive multifocal IOL? Will I have to wear glasses after surgery? And that's where we need to put a break onto them and take a step back. Because we need to decide the IOL or the type of uh, procedure that the patient requires based not only what he can afford or not, what packages you have or not, but also on what the actual eye demands and what the eye is more suitable for. Uh, and this is uh, what we'll try and cover up uh, in, in this course, uh, uh, that is which IOL for which patient uh, and when to select a particular IOL uh, from time to time. Uh, and we'll have uh, for company uh, Dr. Abhay Vasavda, Dr. Ramamurthy, Dr. Samresh and myself. So. Uh, starting with the course itself, uh, the moment we move on, go out and move to the trade, we'll see a plethora and plethora of new instruments. And every company comes up uh, telling that this is their instrument which will solve all the problems that will, this measurement is the most accurate and so on and so forth. So I think with so many newer investigative modalities, cataract surgery has now become as important, pre-operative planning has become as important as the surgery itself. This used to be the paradigm for LASIK or refractive surgery, that is pre-operative diagnostics. But now I think time has come that even cataract surgery or uh, diagnostics have become extremely important. So are these newer investigative di diagnostic technologies just hype or just marketing or is there uh, you know, any additional help that we get? That is an addition, it is, is it just an additional, is it an additional need or just additional cost? Before we actually move on to measuring these patients or using this diagnostics, these are the first couple of slides is I think what defines uh, this entire course. And this is something that all of us need to now pay more and more attention for. That is to have a dedicated pre-operative time slot. You don't want to be, you know, be in a rush in your clinic when there are already 10, 15 patients waiting outside. You are always under pressure to move on fast and quickly and we may not be doing the adequate justice uh, to that eye and to that patient. So it's extremely important to have a dedicated pre-operative time slot and of course a dedicated team for that. For example, at our clinic for the past uh, more than five to seven years, Whenever a patient opts for cataract surgery, we tell them to hold on and come back on a separate day, which is when the, cl the pre-operative clinic is the time when only five or seven of those patients posted for surgery the next or a few days later would be coming. So you have a specialized team, a specialized slot, and I think all of us now start need to give more and more importance to this and create a pre-operative clinic. This is also extremely crucial. Although you may, although the patient may have a unilateral cataract, we need to keep in mind a plan for both eye surgery in the long run for the patient. Therefore, do a comprehensive examination of both eyes together uh, so that a uh, symmetrical plan can be made for both eyes. This may sound silly, uh, more like residency training, but this is something that at least I find very useful to have a fixed written pro forma. That is, these are the 10 things, 11 things, 15 things, etc. whatever you may be doing. These are the things I, that I need to do in this patient before I actually sit, look at the readings and talk to the patient. So having a written pro forma also helps significantly. And now coming, now since we have decided the patient has come for this pre-operative clinic, how do we go about using all of these and many, many more fancy gadgets that uh, many of us have? I think it starts with the very basics, that is to look at the ocular surface. And the ocular surface as more and more all of us are realizing is the cause for the most dissatisfied or the most unhappy 6-6 post-operative patient. And simple tests like a tear film breakup time or a Shermer's test will give a clue towards uh, uh, the ocular surface condition of the patient. Also look at the lid margin carefully because a lot of these uh, meibomian gland dysfunctions may not be bothering him now 
But the moment you operate, the moment you put him on so many post-operative antibiotics, steroids, preservative drops, this will ginger up the ocular surface and make the patient more uncomfortable. But these are subject, so many of these are subjective findings. More and more we want objective documentation of what the status of the ocular surface is and this is something that we have found quite useful in certain select situations. This is a test to measure the osmolarity of the tear film. And all of us know that more osmolar, the higher the value, thicker the tear film or lesser the value, very thin the tear film, both of which are not good. So this is, uh, uh, this, so this comes with a chip card and uh, there are nomograms or values, but any tear film osmolarity more than 308 is a slight red flag. So at least, although even if you, you know, you may not be able to do anything about it, either you can pre-treat these patients with ocular stabilizing medications or forewarn these patients that you are likely to have foreign body sensation uh, until the drops are going on for another month or two or so, so on and so forth. So this is something that we find useful. Now coming to the uh, measurement of the actual IL power, I think optical biometry has changed uh, the way we calculate IL powers in a dramatic way. And now uh, at least from the podium, uh, I would be very confident in saying that contact A scan should be abandoned completely. The next best to optical biometry would be immersion and there are cases where even if you have access to optical biometry because of the type of cataract the optical biometry may not be able to give you a good reading. Now the optical biometry has the newer optical biometers have the advantage not just of getting a good actual length reading but they also give very good keratometry readings which are important also for planning toric IOLs. With further improvements in optical biometers, with the newer generation swept source biometers coming up, uh, uh, notably right now the IL Master 700 from Zeiss and uh, the one from Tomy OA200, there is a higher penetration even in dense cataracts and in posterior subcapsular cataracts, reducing even further the need for immersion A scan. So, we are moving further and improving the way we are measuring axial length as well as keratometry with the newer optical biometers. I'm sorry. Uh, coming to the next investigative diagnostics that is abrometry. Now abrometry until very recently was being considered only and only for hi-fi refractive surgeons when they are talking about flaps, quality of vision, etc. so on and so forth. But having incorporated it and having used it, we find it very useful even for our cataract patients. To simplify what this, this is uh, uh, an eye trace, ray tracing abrometry, uh, where the placido, there is a placido based topography measuring the corneal abrasion and the ray tracing abrometry which measures the total eye abrasions, both of which once you subtract both of them, you get what is the internal abrasions which are most likely to be from the lens. They can be anywhere from the corneal endothelium onto the, re on, onto the retina, most often from the uh, crystalline lens. And this, that's how this, uh, the topography data is also captured from the placido ring based. Also, you get information about the pupil size of the patient. So you get, uh, if, you, if the patient has a large, larger pupil, uh, you know, you may want to choose a particular kind of IOL if the mesopic pupil of the patient doesn't go beyond 2 millimeters. Any form of aspheric or multifocal IOL may not work for this case. So, you also get not only the abrometry data but also the pupil uh, size. And these are some case scenarios how abrometry helps us not only in planning but also in counseling. So, this was a patient uh, planned for cataract surgery and a good diopter, uh, 1.2 diopters of astigmatism and in our enthusiasm we suggested a toric IOL. But the patient shot back and told us that you have just come from a new fresh fellowship and you have this new posters put up in your OPD and now I've never worn a cylindrical glasses in, in my entire life and after 60 years you tell me I have astigmatism which will need this more expensive lens. So, this is where abrometry helped us to convince this patient to use this as a diagnostic tool. Uh, I'm sorry, unfortunately, I'm not able to bring up the mouse here. Yeah. So, uh, this is the internal abrasions of the patient and this is the corneal abrasion. So, if you notice, the corneal astigmatism here is right now being completely neutralized by the internal astigmatism. That is the natural lens of the eye, the cataractus lens. 
Now the moment you remove this and replace this with a simple monofocal lens, this entire corneal astigmatism is going to get manifest, leaving behind a post-operative residual cylinder. And therefore, we discussed this with the patient and explained to him uh, this uh, using this graph and uh, fortunately agreed for the toric IOL and this is the post-operative part of the same patient where the entire corneal astigmatism is almost completely neutralized by the internal toric IOL astigmatism. Now coming to these uh, fancy terms of angle alpha and angle kappa, if you notice here that the abrometry or any eye has three points, that is first the center of the limbus, the center of the pupil and the visual axis. Now the patient is going, the rays of light are going to pass through the center of the visual axis, whereas the IOL is actually going to sit in the center of the capsular bag. So if the angle alpha, that is the angle between the center, sorry, of the visual axis and the center of the limbus is quite off, then what will happen is that although you may do a perfect surgery, well-centered IOL, what you feel in the bag, Post-operatively, what is going to happen is, with this large angle alpha, the patient's visual axis is actually going to pass through, if you notice here, through these multifocal rings. This is going to lead not much of a refractive surprise, but this is going to increase the photic or mesopic phenomenon that the patients are going to have post-operatively. So therefore, more chances of glare and halos. And for now, there is no golden cutoff line, but most experts believe that anywhere around 0.4 to 0.5 angle alpha should be considered as a red flag or a uh, you know cutoff for multifocal IELTS. If there is one investigative technology which I think has revolutionized not only retinal surgeons but even all general ophthalmologists, I think that is the optical coherence or, uh, tomography or the OCT. And so often we come across these absolutely healthy looking normal retinas having a distorted foveal contour because of epiretinal membranes. And therefore, we decided uh, to conduct a study to find out how many patients uh, who are undergoing actual cataract surgery have macular pathology, which a retinal surgeon has put up in his notes to be a normal retina and a normal fundus. What we found in our results, the good part is that in 95% of the eyes, we could capture an OCT. So the OCT is able to capture even in very significantly dense cataracts. So it has a good penetration. In what I said, normal, in, in those diagnosed with the normal fundus by retinal surgeon beware, OCT examination revealed ERM in 7% eyes, RP irregularity in 4% and foveal attenuation vitreomacular attraction in about 3%. So all of these patients were missed out not just by the general ophthalmologist but even by the retinal surgeon on 78 and 90 d clinical examination. And this is a classical example of a normal looking fundus showing a vitreomacular attraction or an early lamellar macular hole uh, in the post-operative period. Uh, and coming to finally the corneal investigations, uh, there are, they may not be required in all situations, but particularly in abnormal or special situations like this, where, where you are considering toric IOLs, where the readings are showing, may or may not be showing re, uh, great astigmatism, you need to look at the regularity of the astigmatism. And more and more importance is now being given to the posterior corneal curvature, not just as far as detecting pathology goes, but also as far as IOL power calculation goes. And there are devices now or instruments which measure the posterior corneal curvature like the Pentacam. Uh, uh, if, if you see here, this is the front, the topography map, this is the pachymetry map, this is the anterior elevation and the posterior elevation. And you may be able to pick up cases like this with high posterior corneal astigmatism or elevation which may be suggestive of a form fruit keratoconus. And these are the patients where you want to avoid a particular kind of a premium IOL. Uh, so I think newer diagnostics, of course, not everything that comes new is good or useful. There have been, you know, instruments which we, which we have bought and we have found after six months they are of no use to us. But I think we need to have a positive mindset and keep moving forward. And newer diagnostics, I think, are going to help us to raise the bar as far as expectation managements are concerned, as far as creating more and more happy patients are concerned, and in creating more predictable and precise uh, outcomes. So thank you very much.
I would now uh, invite Dr. Abhay Vasavda to talk about customized IOL solutions for each patient. Yes, we can uh, have questions uh, after every talk, if there are any. Okay. While we are waiting, I want to recognize two individuals in the hall, uh, past president Dr. N.S.D. Raju and the president Amulya Sahu of the manual small incision cataract surgery, which is promoted all over the world. So thank you, sir, for attending. And uh, those who are still doing this wonderful technique of small incision manual technique, Everything we say is relevant 100%. You can do exactly the same detailed preoperative evaluation. Consider the what kind of IOL will put, when will you put, and so on. So just be, stay tuned with us, and you will be okay. Uh, we all receive research grant support at our center from Alcon, but has no uh, relevance to this uh, topic, uh, except that you will hear or see restore return, which is a synonym of traditional multifocal lens of 3 or 3.5, 2.5 addition. But the, the key is now made for you. I think the time has gone that uh, you never bothered about the cylinders or, or these requirements. You have a cataract, white opacity, dense brown, and you remove it. Patient doesn't know what was done and is happy. I think we now, patients are demanding, and it's good that demanding because they are demanding because we have created made them aware that we can do so many things. Sometimes in our enthusiasm, we, we overdo it and we, we are paying the price for it in some areas. But basically, we need to make, make made for you. But, but as uh, Dr. Shail said in his opening uh, statements, the whole focus now has changed from the technicalities, how to perform, how to make incision, one plane, three plane, rexes, this rexes, that. It's all okay. Everybody does a great job of lens removal without rapture, without uh, corneal edema. What is now important is to deliver to this patient good quality vision. And I don't mean necessarily spectacle free vision because uh, to progress, we moved from this uh, concept to give a refractive cataract surgery as the name given to the surgery, which is good. And it helped us to uh, refine our IOL calculation and so on, but now we move on even beyond refractive cataract surgery and our aim is to give a quality functional vision, which may mean using uh, some glasses at some point of time. So you must understand that the baseline is to deliver quality, good functional vision. And, and uh, this is uh, Dr. Samresh, whom you will hear next, has made this wonderful animation uh, what this traditional multifocal of plus 3, 3.25, 3.5 do to our, uh, to our vision that uh, the, the distance vision goes to the peripheral part and the, the rings and diffractive element gives a near focus and therefore patients are able to see both. And patients were very happy when we started this in our evolution. And, and there are, as I said, these are the traditional multifocals, and there are various examples of it. But soon the industry realized, and the clinician realized, and patients made us aware by complaints because they were unhappy. That it's okay that they can see uh, without glasses, but majority or many of these people who were educated, who were demanding, active individuals, younger ones, were not very happy. They were not terribly excited about it. So in a way, it delivers something, but, but it's like a quality versus flexibility of not using. But all of these lenses, uh, including trifocals, have dysphotopsia inherent in the designs. So we must tell these patients, and if some patient you must to avoid if they have that particular. So we need to judiciously combine this quality uh, of vision with extended range of vision. And that, that's what the prudence the experience in your locality, in your patients, will come. Now, this is something you'll keep hearing about it, and many of these terms are more of a marketing than of a true science, like extended depth of focus lenses. They actually are low add multifocals. In this example, it could be plus 1.75 add, and they function exactly like low add, and we'll come to that. So, all of these actually uh, is the optical uh, genesis how they give this extended depth 
of field of vision, but it is the extended depth of field of vision that we are interested. How we do it is it's an individual case, uh, scenario, and in your choice and, and experience. So. Uh, one of the things which is necessary for that is the depth of field, and many of us, I didn't understand the depth of field, and once again somebody showed this, this beautiful diagram that uh, the area which you are seeing now in the focus interest and in front and around in a 360 degree sphere is the depth of field, still getting a, acceptable uh, clarity on those focus subjects. And these uh, low power ads, uh, small aperture IOLs and extended depth of focus IOLs, which is actually, as I said just now, our 1.75 ad multifocal, do that. Now, low power ad, uh, unlike the traditional multifocal, gives a better distance vision because the, the, the rings are designed in such a way in all these three companies that they give more distance vision, akin or almost like distance vision, but also, in addition, they give uh, intermediate vision uh, because this distance vision is good because it comes from many regions of the IOL surface and this is an intermediate uh, looking at SMS and uh, watching television at the same time. So TV watching and texting is good because of these low ad and uh, some race explains uh, this way. So this is one example of that which is really designed for distance and also give intermediate vision better than monofocal, better than multifocal lens, traditional multifocal lens. So this is the only lens, these three lenses, which gives uh, good distance vision and, and a good intermediate. The Symphony, the 2.5, uh, the Oculentis, and so on. And uh, however, all of these three lenses will need two things. One is the low power readers, and generally they are about 1.25 or whatever, but remember they all will need extra light. So please tell them before you, they, you decide on the lens that you will need an extra light and if you cannot have that, please do not go for lenses. So this is uh, a simple example of an, uh, that, that concept going on uh, in, the, in the eye, in the bag, and total cover is good. So as I said, they have a good distance vision, better intermediate, but also they have a less incidence. In my experience, it's minimal. It's not 100% nil, but it's minimal bothersome uh, this photopsy of halos and glare because of the uh, design, the area which is there. And they do need extra light, and this is very important. Extra light, contrast sensitivity, you know, all this multifocal, including symphony, including everything, goes down uh, compared to monofocal. So you must tell the patients, and this is how the, the, the company explains how they arrange uh, that extended depth there. All right. Now, uh, but there are, so therefore, there are categories of patients when you say made for you, the patients who are die hard say, I don't want doctor any glasses. I don't want to be seen with glasses. It's, it's not good for my profession, my image, and my, my mindset. You can consider uh, many things. One of them is blended vision, as they call it. In other words, treat one eye for a distance and intermediate, and, and treat other eye uh, with a reading and uh, like uh, people have done with monovision, with monofocal. Now, this is the traditional multifocal of Zeiss, Technis, Restore, whatever, plus three ad, which will give a, a good distance. So you can see that uh, uh, the, lap, the mobile uh, material going on, and 2.5 giving a, a very nice intermediate on the, on, the, on the desk there. So you can blend this eye, and, and you can do that, and trifocal does uh, more or less same like the traditional multifocals, but has an advantage of giving a better intermediate vision uh, depending upon the designs they go for. And there are at the moment three major companies making uh, similar concept with very minor modification of the distance that intermediate will give 60 centimeter or 75 and so on. But, but whatever that is, they all are, are an improvement on the traditional multifocal, but it will still have the same negative of dysphotopsia, and still they will have a low contrast. There is other co clever concept in acufocus lenses, and, and Kimura, uh, the Kimura, or whatever you call it, in a corneal implant, has the same principle, the same company makes a small pupil IOLs, and then we have in our course next September, 
uh, Dr. Fernando Trinidad coming in our, as a faculty, and he has developed such a uh, uh, concept, a very beautiful lens, which gives a good uh, cosmosis and also uh, good depth. And this is what that Sumrish diagram comes back, extended depth of fill. Uh, but once again, you have to pay the price, and the price is in the illumination. So you need an extra illumination because of that you will say. So whatever you decide, you understand the product or a technology, but more important is to understand the patient because you want to do ma made for you patient and therefore all the profile which you heard in the first, uh, first uh, lecture and understand the patient and counsel and counsel and counsel. I take much more time now in, than ever before uh, I've done in my career because you need to understand and counsel negative and the positive of that concept you have. There are many other lenses coming up. This is one more example. Uh, this is a new concept to remove the dysphotopsia. This is Dr. Masket, where he based this uh, IOL fixation on the groove, uh, which is like a Marie uh, bag in the IOL concept, but fixating only in the intercapsule, and that uh, dysphotopsia is good. Probably it will have more PCO, like the reverse optic capture. And there is another lens which my friend Gerd Aufat showed me, Femtis. All of both of these lenses will work better with flex rexes because you can control the size uh, of the opening and therefore you can fix it, but guaranteed no negative dysphotopsia or any other kind. So once again, I just want to remind you, it, it is not a refractive cataract surgery alone now. We need to move from refractive cataract surgery to deliver good quality of function, and I'm just going to go very, tell me about the time. Okay, so this is the case of 82 years old lady, uh, has become forgetful now, and I'm, I can understand her. I, I'm also, my memory is not as sharp as it used to be. So I, I understood her very well, had a bilateral cataracts, and we advise our multifocal traditional. You can decide your lens of choice, but traditional multifocal, and she doesn't need to bother about and depend on her higher cortex and she's happy because the requirements were limited. Now this is unlike that case, a, an active individual, professional individual, but also a hobby of playing sports. And therefore, uh, his range of vision, but he's worried, he's heard about the stories about the friends that if they were not happy. This patient, but it's so familiar to us, isn't it? When a patient comes, and we suggest that you can consider multifocal, and then say, yeah, but you know my friend, he's not very happy. So that, that spreads very fast, uh, all the negatives. So we advise him uh, that you can still consider 2.5 low ads because you will have a good range as, a, as a, an intermediate, in a, as an uh, active professional, IT individual, banker, whatever, and you can do your hobby, but minimal glare. So uh, as long as you understand, you'll have to wear reading glasses. So those who are very fastidious, like some of us, or who are very precision-oriented, they want everything nice. This is one option. Other option would be to blend that, and we'll come to that in a minute. But these all are additional benefits of monofocal, but that does mean reading glasses for more, less than N8 or N10 size on a bright light. So you decide. Many patients won't mind accepting reading glasses, but it, it, you need to discuss it out. It is compatible with uh, unilateral cataract, as was mentioned in the first one. And, and it works all the time on the computer. And as you would expect, uh, the, he, he, the, his complaints with glare and eye strain, but like the volleyball in the previous case, he goes on a weekend with motorbike. So no halos we want. Uh, it's dangerous traffic all over India now, not only in Coimbatore, everywhere. Uh, we, we decided that give a lens which is minimal halos or practically no unilateral low ad. Uh, compatible with a natural fix, so you can do that. And we now have uh, getting interested in blended vision, which we're never interested in because we always believe the symmetrical input to the visual cortex is superior, but there are individuals who won't mind that. So we are now uh, placing a traditional multifocal in the one eye where the, we want to give a reading vision more and, and uh, other eye with low ads. And this is a typical example that uh, this is actually a retired teacher of one of our children, li likes watching TV, knitting, activities on WhatsApp, and, and uh, do everything without glasses. She wanted that. So we, we considered, talked about it, and we said we'll put plus three distance near and uh, this thing there. So 
so the patient was very happy, and uh, this is the outcome. So finally, my, my, my pulse and what I learned in my journey that uh, you must mention the limitation of the technology first before you say, I'll give you roses and flowers and everything. It is our moral duty, ethical duty, and legal responsibility to tell them, please, this is a limitation of what, if you want to achieve, and if I want you to help you to achieve the target of minimal dependence, you will, in the package, have these limitations. And if you understand how important it is to have not to wear glasses, you will accept it. There's also a thing called neurosensory adaptation, and you will get used to it by you, in other words, counseling, counseling, and counseling. Thank you so very much. I think more and more of us are realizing that not just multifocal IOLs are not just the only IOLs which are important, but treating or correcting as much of refractive error is becoming equally important. And one of the most common refractive errors which we as surgeons have ignored for many, many years is astigmatism. That, you know, if it's less than this much, forget about it, this kind of incision, that kind of incision, so on and so forth. But now I think time has come and it's time tested the technology that toric IOLs need to be incorporated for every surgeon's armamentarium. So it's not just for the uh, extremely, uh, you know, fancy practices or hi-fi practices, but toric IOLs is something that needs to be incorporated in every surgeon's day-to-day -day cataract practice. And why do I say that? Because pre-existing corneal astigmatism is a problem. We evaluated 2,000 eyes who had come just for the routine clinic and found that 78% of them, so that's a huge number, two-third of them had more than half a diopter of astigmatism. And 42, so almost, you know, close to half of them had more than one diopter of astigmatism. So astigmatism is real and is a significant problem. And how much of astigmatism matters? Like I said, there, is, there has been debate that should you treat astigmatism more than 1.5, 1.5, so on and so forth. And to do that, again, we did a study of over 2,000 eyes where we divided patients into groups having less than 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 1, and more than one diopter of astigmatism. And we found that any astigmatism of more than 0.5 diopters affects the contrast sensitivity, the reading acuity, and the reading speed, even when they are collect, corrected on their spectacles with that astigmatism. So why consider toric IOLs when there are so many other options like limbal relaxing incisions, like LRIs, like opposite clear corneal incisions, like making an incision on the steep axis, so on and so forth. Toric IOLs because first of all, they are a component of what we are doing anyway. So apart from just placing the IOL at a particular axis, there is absolutely nothing different that you need to do in the entire surgery. The astigmatism correction is definitely more accurate and more permanent and predictable. So unlike LRIs where, which can regress over a time, you are not sure how the cornea is going to heal based on the age of the patient, the vascularity, so on and so forth. This is definitely more precise and more accurate and there are no chances of any regression. The biggest hurdle that most of us feel while starting toric IOLs is that we get intimidated with numbers and we feel that we need all the possible diagnostics, equipments, and how do I calculate and how will I convince the patient and so on and so forth. So let's see what, what are the things that we find useful when we started implementing toric IOLs as a routine in our clinical practice. I think there are three basic points that all of us need to look at. First is to understand the kind and the type and the total astigmatism that the patient has. Once you do that, now you need to measure it correctly and then you need to implant the toric IOL at the correct axis. And let's go step by step. Understanding the astigmatism. So the astigmatism is not just what you measure. Remember, you are going to do a surgery and that is also going to change the astigmatism, you may induce or reduce some astigmatism from case to case. So the astigmatism can be divided into two components. First is the pre-existing astigmatism and second is the surgically induced astigmatism. Uh, and each surgeon must calculate his surgically induced astigmatism. Fortunately, with all the work that Dr. Graham Barrett and Dr. Warren Hill have done, 
Surgeons using 2.2 or 2.4 millimeters incisions can safely use an SIA of 0.1 without actually having to calculate your own SIA. And that is because now more emphasis is given to the centroid value of SIA rather than the mean or the median. Uh, again, this, this is the most common or most debated thing that because the astigmatism is with the rule, I'll operate with a superior incision, otherwise I would have operated with a temporal incision. It has once again been shown with extensive work done by Dr. Warren Hill, Dr. Graham Barrett, Dr. Holliday, Dr. Abu Lafia, that each incision, each size will have a different SIA because astigmatism is not just magnitude, it is a vector. It is magnitude as well as direction. So on axis and off axis is not something that we must be considering and try and keep your incision as stable and do it on a consistent basis from the same location. How do we measure keratometry or how do we measure astigmatism? Ideally, you must have at least more than one uh, measuring device to actually confirm the magnitude as well as the axis. Uh, manual keratometry still holds gold standard and can be used as the first line, but you must have at least one or the other form of either auto keratometers, uh, particularly the newer optical biometers like the Lenstar, IOL Master, Tomi, so on and so forth. And the second thing that you need to confirm is whether the astigmatism is regular or irregular. Because remember, toric IOLs or any form of astigmatism correction uh, devices can correct only regular astigmatism and not irregular astigmatism. And to measure regular or regularity or irregularity of astigmatism, you need either topography or tomography based devices like Placido based tom to topographers or uh, shine flux based devices. Few years ago, Dr. Douglas Koch in his landmark uh, article here questioned the, uh, uh, the way we measure corneal astigmatism and he brought about very importantly that we are all not considering what the posterior cornea is telling us or we are not actually measuring the posterior corneal astigmatism. Uh, and he, uh, there are now, because now there are devices which can measure that, he did a study on several thousands of eyes and to broadly generalize came up with a nomogram that if the patient has with the rule astigmatism, you need to undercorrect it by 0.3 diopters. That is because the posterior corneal uh, is, ag I mean, is against the rule, posterior cornea, and in against the rule astigmatism, you need to overcorrect it by 0.3 diopters. So this was the broad generalized nomogram that he came up with uh, a few years uh, back. Now, to factor in the posterior corneal curvature, there are various ways. Either you can directly input if you have access to tomography devices like Scheinflug, like Galilee, like Pentacam, or you can use, a, use these, you know, nomograms, uh, like the one I showed you, the Baylor nomogram or the Abu Lafia Koch formula. Fortunately, Dr. Graham Barrett has, has made life extremely easy for us. And his, in his new Barrett Toric calculator, it has an inbuilt you know, uh, uh, sort of insurance for the posterior corneal curvature for each eye based on his own mathematical model. So now we don't really need to measure or even actually bother about what the posterior corneal astigmatism is doing. We just need to enter it into the Barrett Toric calculator. And I think this has actually changed the entire way Toric IOL has act be is being practiced. Uh, and uh, we cannot be, you know, thankful enough to Dr. Barrett who has put this up all for free for everyone to access on the APACRS website and the ASCRS website. So this is his historic calculator, the algorithm where you enter all of the data and based on which he will give you uh, what is the best uh, uh, option for this patient. So it factors in the posterior corneal curvature, the axial length, lens thickness, anterior chamber depth, and it, is, it has been calibrated for most commercially available international IOLs. A further modification, and this is very important, uh, of Dr. Barrett's calculator is the K calculator version, which is also available now free online, is that for people like me who get confused that I have three devices, all three are giving, one is giving 10 degrees, one is giving zero degrees, one is giving 175. Which do I, which value do I take up? One is saying 44.1, one is saying 44.3, which magnitude do I take? So to average out all of this, Dr. Barrett has come up with the K calculator, 
where you can enter values of up to three different devices and he has standardized it, standardized it for about 10 different instruments uh, which are commercially available right now and whatever based on whatever you input the vector calculation will average out and will tell you what would be the ideal for this patient. So uh, now you even don't have to bother about selecting a perfect reading for that particular patient. You can enter all the data that you have uh, and the calculator will do all the work for you. And most uh, newer company calculators have also incorporated this. Uh, the Alcon Acrisoft Toric calculator has also incorporated the Barrett Storic Calculator algorithm into it. So you can even directly access the company websites. And uh, if, you, if you have access to Lenstar, the Lenstar also comes with the Barrett Toric suit. So you don't even need to go online or go anywhere uh, to enter the data. Uh, whatever data that is captured from the Lenstar, it will already give you with the axis placement and the model of the Toric IL to be placed. So I think uh, calculating has become quite easy. There have been various literature reports now showing that actually incorporating or adding the posterior corneal curvature value from what you calculate from PentaCam is inferior to using the new Barrett Toric calculator. So like I said, you don't really need to measure or worry that you don't have PentaCam or you don't have Galilee and you can't measure the um, you know, posterior cornea. Now since we have, now we have measured and now we, are, we have to actually go on and perform the surgery. And to align the toric, the first uh, step that all of us need to do is to mark the patient. Having tried different devices, we find the freehand marking to be as good or as bad as any other marking device. Uh, and the trick is to make sure that the limbal area is dry. We ask the patient to sit and look at a distance target and whatever we feel is 0 and 180, we actually mark that. Uh, you may not necessarily need to make three marks. Uh, but you can make two or three, whatever uh, you, that you find. With the era of newer fancy imaging devices, with newer cameras, with newer photo slits, there's this very simple app designed once again by Dr. Graham Barrett known as the Toric Cam app, which is available right now only on the App Store. But it uses the iPhone's gyroscope. That is, it measures, you take a photograph of your marking and it will tell you how much above or how much below you are actually to your zero degree. So although here I felt my nasal mark should be zero, it's actually two, not zero. And for example, here it's 178. So the Toric Cam app is a, is a you know, useful device which helps us to evaluate our own markings and you can use this adjustment intraoperatively that you are two degrees already off and align them accordingly. Intraoperative surgical toric IL alignment is actually not at all intimidating. Once again, some steps that you need to follow. First is to make sure that before you actually do the marking, you must dry the area where you are going to place your Mendes ring. Because sometimes fluid can seep in through this and blotch your marks. Once the area is dry, you can use this and make either one or two uh, markings. With the parallax, it's impossible to align your toric IOLs on both sides. Therefore, we have now stopped marking on both sides and mark only on the proximal side to the surgeon's eyepiece view. Once that is done, you place the IOL. And once the IOL is placed, we actually have stopped rotating it before actually removing the viscoelastic. So the traditional teaching is to rotate it until it is about 20 degrees close to the uh, you know pupillary axis. But with bimanual, bimanual irrigation aspiration, leaving the IOL in this direction makes it a lot easier to remove the viscoelastic from behind the bag. And it's very critical in toric IOL cases to remove all the viscoelastic from inside the bag so that there is no rotation of the IOL inside the capsular bag. Once all the viscoelastic is removed, you can use the same bimanual IE as your dialers. So you reduce your parameters to the lowest vacuum and the lowest flow rate to basically polish parameters. And then you can use your irrigation or the aspiration handpiece to dial the toric IOL into place. The good part about toric IOLs, uh, particularly with the Acrisoft platform, is that the post-operative rotation is very minimal. So Whatever you leave behind, you are going to leave it, it's going to be there at the end. 
always make sure in toric aisles that the eyeball doesn't the globe doesn't the chamber doesn't collapse so always hydrate your wounds before you remove your irrigation because some forward movement or sudden shallowing of the chamber may lead to some rotation of the toric aisles and now there are intraoperative imaging devices like this particular one uh, the varion that we have uh, access to where you where it takes a photograph starting before surgery which it compares with the preoperative measured photograph and once that is done you don't actually need to make you know markings uh, uh, is, while IOL placement it also helps us in making our incisions at the correct location uh, what we feel 90 180 or at 10 degrees we can exactly make incisions at that location and uh, finally aligning the IOLs you can uh, you know these marks help us to align it like manual marking so they have improved the efficiency of doing that and there is literature to support that cyclotorsion uh, is, be, is better compensated with these imaging devices than with our manual marking devices uh, and what, what the keratometry the varion measures is compared to the gold standard keratometry me measuring devices right now. Uh, further IOL misalignment is also less. A further step up uh, moving forward uh, to Varion is intraoperative abrometry where you can actually real time fine tune your IOL placement. So this is the actual measurement uh, in the aphakic mode that is once the lens is removed and it will tell us what is the intraoperative refraction and based on which what IOL power and what toric model should or should not be used in that patient. And intraoperative abro, there is, you know, more and more literature coming up that uh, compared to standard biometry, it may actually help us enhance our toric outcomes in the times to come. So to end, I would say that any amount of astigmatism needs to be corrected. Even lower amounts of astig residual uh, toric IOLs give even lower amounts of residual astigmatism compared to relaxing incisions. However, there will be significant number of patients who will be left behind with some post-operative astigmatism. But any post-operative astigmatism less than about a half a diopter is clinically acceptable in today's uh, time with today's pre-operative and intra-operative measuring techniques. So I think there is no reason why all of us should not incorporate toric IOLs uh, into our day-to-day -day practice. And uh, believe me, it will help in uh, improving the visual outcomes and the patient satisfaction significantly. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure that Dr. Ramamurthy has come here in his busy schedule. Uh, when you come and start, would you also comment on your tips on TORIC very briefly before you uh, go to your topic, uh, Dr. Ramamurthy, please? Uh, before he does, I just want to uh, tell the facts that although the 0.5 diopter astigmatism uh, bothers, it is almost impossible to correct that in the present scenario in a patient. So do not be very ambitious or suggest toric lens. If the total astigmatism is going to be 0.5 or so, you are likely that you will not succeed. Uh, in my enthusiasm, uh, I tried and I failed. Another fact I want to tell you is that it's in about 70 to 75 percent, some say 80 percent, but I think 70 plus, that you will have a good targeted refraction in astigmatism point of view. 25 percent or so will have still off your target astigmatism. Luckily, majority of these patients are okay in that they have an unaided acceptable vision, but purely an objective way. So in other words, this science is good, but it's not perfect yet. It's not that enough. So uh, please comment on these and then uh, we'll talk, please. I think uh, Shell did a wonderful job of uh, covering this topic quite comprehensive. There is very little for me to add. It was so crystal clear, but just a couple of points that came midway through his talk. I don't know whether he had covered. I have a greater propensity for cover, uh, correcting against the rule astigmatism than with the rule astigmatism. In the sense that my, when I take up these patients for toric intraocular lenses, even if uh, one 1.25 diopters of, uh, even a 0.75 to 1 diopter of against the rule astigmatism, I go ahead and uh, consider a toric intraocular lens implantation. 
while for a with the rule astigmatism about 1.25 to 1.5. It might sound counterintuitive because most of our incisions are temporarily placed, but as uh, Shell uh, very clearly uh, mentioned, that uh, because of the work done by Doc Cock and others, Graham Barrett and others, now all of us believe in this concept of uh, centroid value for the astigmatism induced. And uh, it's more in the range of just about 0.1 diopter for a 2.2 millimeter incision. There is also with the aging of the patient, there is about a three-eighth of a diopter per decade of the lifetime of a patient, the shift of the um, astigmatism from with the rule to against the rule. That's the reason in the younger patients, we come across the, those coming for LASIK, we go come across more often uh, with the rule astigmatism, those presenting for cataract surgery against the rule astigmatism. So young patient with the rule astigmatism, uh, young patient against the rule astigmatism, I would be uh, wary of putting in a toric intraocular lens unless it's quite significant, but especially if it's with the rule astigmatism, go ahead and uh, use these lenses more often. And especially with multifocal intraocular lenses, the more you debulk the amount of astigmatism that you uh, deal with, the better are the results. So I think uh, the fact that notoric multifocal intraocular lenses are also available is a great way forward. And uh, finally, cost is a factor. I think just as we, many of us have shifted on to single piece aspheric lenses, you know, reasonably good toric intraocular lenses are becoming available from Indian manufacturers also. And I think just as you won't prescribe glasses without correcting astigmatism, whenever we are present doing cataract surgery, which is refractive surgery today, addressing toricity is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure and a honor to be uh, invited by Dr. Vasavda to be a part of his course. I think uh, they truly are the first family of cataract surgery in India. And uh, the topic given to me is enhancing the use of multifocal intraocular lenses. I'm a speaker and I travel, uh, do receive travel support from some of these companies which uh, all are in the business of uh, manufacturing intraocular lenses. So today, uh, the current standards in uh, cataract outcomes have undergone a sea change. Uh, it's not uh, vision restorative, vision re enhancing, but it's vision enhancing and not vision re restorative. We are concerned about uncorrected visual equity for all distances. And perhaps cataract surgery gives us an opportunity to not address just the quantity of vision, but also the quality of vision. Patients are also concerned about immediate restoration of vision. And since many of them live on to their 80s and 90s, leading fairly active lifestyles, and some of them present to us in their 40s and 50s uh, for a cataract surgery with a 6-9 or a 6-6 pass vision, if they might uh, far outlive our own professional lifetimes and what we do today is extremely important for them for the next three to four decades. So there is no question that toric intraocular lenses is the way to go, but multifocal lenses you might have your uh, uh, reservations. Depending upon the kind of company slides that you use, you might see all these kind of uh, um, dysphotopsia being represented. But then essentially uh, you cannot buy multifocality or vision for all distances without using the currency of contrast. And that is the reason that the, the very fact is that uh, multifocality in the human eye is non-physiological. There's no visual system that is multifocal in mammals. So essentially, whenever we do something physiological, we are successful. When blood pressure goes up, we bring it down. When intraocular pressure goes up, we bring it down. When the lens becomes opaque, we replace it with that transparent lens. But multifocality was never in the scheme of things as far as uh, uh, the visual system of the human eye is concerned. And that might be the reason that why we are facing challenges. And there is an ongoing interest in accommodative lenses, which might be more physiological. But having said that, today we still do not have an accommodative lens which performs optimally. And that's the reason that we still keep talking about multifocal intraocular lenses. And we might continue doing that for a uh, decade or more. And the aim is to make a more physiological division of light. All these multifocal lenses are based on the principle of uh, simultaneous macular perception, where image from two different distances are simultaneously brought to a precise focus out of the macula. And the brain has to discriminate between these two images. And whenever this division is di uh, diminished, that's when these lenses um, tend to perform better. I slightly altered my presentation from what I did in the previous years. Today, I would strongly advocate any of you 
uh, seriously interested in multifocal interocular lenses to read this article on survey of ophthalmology, which is a major review on multifocal interocular lenses, published just last year. And they say the five factors determining success of a multifocal lens is the patient's age, lifestyle, and psychological profile. Next is the comorbidities, that especially those that can impact on contrast, that is the coexistence of, say, macular problems, uh, glaucoma, uh, corneal diseases, etc. Pupil size in different light and time environments, especially if it's extremely constricted pupil, obviously multifocality may not function quite optimally. Again, extremely dilated, a mesopic or a scotopic pupil is size of, say, 6.57 millimeters which is somewhat unusual in our population, especially in the elderly age group, might have, um, might predispose to greater uh, dysphotopsia. Again, it's extremely important to, we have the freedom of choice today, and we have to go by the peer-reviewed, unbiased literature published for different intraocular lenses when we, co when we come to the choice of intraocular lenses. Most importantly is that surgeon's attitude, education, and experience. Maybe all the other four factors that we mentioned about is something that's not even in our hands. But this, the courses like this are essentially meant towards changing this. And I just know I'm coming from a course where almost 50% uh, of the surgeons over there, quite a few of them youngsters, said that they would seriously consider adapting multifocal intraoc lenses. This is a sea change from what we used to experience just about five years back. So this also leads on to satisfaction, dissatisfaction, but the patient is satisfied if the ultimate outcome the refractive outcome is low astigmatism, either because of your pre-selection or because you implanted toric multifocals or address the uh, astigmatism on the corneal surface using a limbal relaxing incision or a laser arcuate keratotomy. If there's good visual uh, performance, that is there's a minimal amount of dysphotopsia and there's also low spectacle dependence. Whenever a patient preoperatively is compulsive, extremely orderly, competent, dutiful, then these patients might be those who might may not be appropriate candidates. Mind you, essentially the, um, the lifestyle of the patient or the success that the patient has achieved is not, doesn't necessarily correlate with the personality of the patient. I have several of Rotary District Governors, Member of Parliaments, Industry Captains who have multifocal intraocular lenses. My uh, optometrist just recorded as a 6-9-N8 vision. They seem to be quite satisfied. But the other, this uh, uh, old lady whom you think would be l l largely uncomplaining, quietly comes and says, I see that uh, glow around, that halo around the dia that upsets me keeps repeating it again and again, not very aggressive, but obviously a dissatisfied patient. So essentially you have to spend a significant amount of time uh, uh, determining what exactly is best for that patient. Uh, contact A-scan is out, immersion A-scan and laser interference biometry is what you must consider. Where the advantage of laser interference inter biometry is more forgiving, but if immersion biometry is also very well done, then definitely you can uh, get excellent results. This was the formula, this was the cable I used to swear by on holiday two was what I used to consider because uh, it, it was taken into consideration seven different variables. But just as uh, Cheryl just mentioned to you, Barrett has got a whole suite of formulas and today it's Barrett Universal 2. So called simply because it's right from minus 10 to plus 40 doctors, it's quite reliable, it's well established and it's made available in ASCRS, APACRS, some of the uh, uh, instruments, the, the IOL Master 700, the Linstar have it incorporated. So even if you don't have a, a access to those instruments, it's important that you start using reliable formula, not just for your multifocals, but for monofocals. Ocular surface issues, I'm going to quickly cover then having, addressing a capsular opacity as and when it occurs, uh, even three months after surgery, ensuring that there, there are no pre-existent retinal diseases because they always, these are some of the comorbidities that could be easily missed by an anterior segment surgeon. And if you implant a multifocal implant in these patients, they are going to be unhappy simply because the pre-existent disease causes contrast loss and the lens that you implant is going to add on to that. Centration of the intraocular lenses is something that we do not uh, uh, attach too much importance to, but it's extremely important. You can see two eyes of the same patient that I have implanted. 
a very well centered lens and this is obviously decentered this would lead on to coma and trefoil and sometimes this may be even though there's a good capsular excess overlap if there's a la large angle alpha you could get a situation like this that's the reason we look into that a regular topography it's extremely important that even if there's corneal astigmatism you have to it has to be regular and you 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 consider to uh, toric multifocal implants now i'm sure uh, somebody should be talking more uh, uh, eloquently on this but today, considering higher order abrasions is extremely important. Whenever you select a cornea, which has very little corneal uh, higher order abrasion, these are the patients who are extremely happy. Again, for me, angle alpha is more important than angle kappa as far as multifocal or uh, intraocular lenses is concerned. Angle kappa is more for refractive surgery. And whenever angle alpha textbook says 0.5 millimeters, my cutoff is 0.8 millimeters. It has to be less than that for me to consider multifocal intraocular lens. And uh, uh, I think doing excellent uh, surgery, and you don't necessarily have to possess a, uh, a, a, a femtosecond laser platform for that. I'm sure most of us are doing repeatable, predictable FACO emulsification, and it's extremely important that you have control over that. Access to instruments like this, which gives you a digital guidance and controls almost every step of your surgery, is definitely an add-on. But mind you, you do not have to wait for processing a, a laser interference biometry or a, a varion or even a, a flax instrument to go ahead and incorporate multifocal intraocular lenses in your practice. Today, we also have the freedom of choice as far as multifocal intraocular lenses are concerned. You have the low ad multifocus, the plus 2.5, the plus 3 ads. I'm not going to the, go into the details of this. Implant the first eye of the patient, look at the comfort level of that patient with the intermediate or near, and accordingly, you can titrate the second eye, uh, maybe even mix and match some of these lenses, so that one eye may be 6, 9, N6, the other eye may be 6, 6, N8, but then bilaterally implanted, these patients are extremely happy. You also have this extensive depth of vision lenses. Each of them, as I mentioned, it's important, it's not necessary that you need to have each and every one of these lenses in your armamentarium. Whatever you choose, base, uh, uh, zero in on them, understand these lenses, make your own concepts dependent on what you hear, what you read, and then uh, once you incorporate these lenses and stay with them, you will find that you get a mostly satisfied patients. Today you also have trifocal intraocular lenses. Panoptics has not become available, but wherever it has become available, it's literally cannibalized uh, restore, and uh, most of uh, our colleagues abroad are extremely happy with this. Other platforms are also available, and I do consider that once you understand these lenses and incorporate them in your practice, you will get to uh, very successful, happy patients. Toric multifocal lenses is again an important addition to our armamentarium, and whenever you min minimize residual cylinder, uh, it leads to a happy patient. It's not just uh, whenever I have a significant cylinder that's left over, I usually after three to four months, I go ahead and correct it with, uh, uh, with a laser vision correction. But then uh, addressing it even preoperatively is a significant uh, way forward. And now it's not even that uh, we have to um, charge our patients extremely high amounts to incorporate these lenses. I must confess that uh, the lenses that are uh, imported are slightly better, but then having said that, today multiple options are getting, uh, becoming available from Indian companies also, and uh, these are also advancing. You can, they, some of them are injectable, preloaded, and toric multifocal options, etc. And maybe you could consider using them also, just in case the cost is an uh, important criteria. The reason, the point I want to drive home is that once you are a reasonably confident phaco emulsification surgeon, you owe it to yourself and owe it to your patients to incorporate, select the right kind of patients and incorporate torics and multifocals in your practice. As I just mentioned, I think if there is residual sphere and cylinder, these are the uh, things which predispose to extreme unhappiness. Prevention is best, so select, uh, do accurate biometry, ensure that uh, uh, the astigmatism is also addressed, but just in case there is a residual uh, uh, refractive error that's left over, Without charging these patients, we offer three months after the subsequent primary surgery a uh, touch-up procedure. We call it vision enhancement. We yeah. actually talk about this even preoperatively while talking to these patients and tell them that such a step might be necessary. Once you do this, it's not just the requirement for glasses, but even the problem of dysphotopsy significantly reduces. And I think uh, having access to a laser vision correction system is extremely important. 
I'd like to dwell a little bit on this, that is neuroadaptation. I think every time we change glasses, every time we prescribe contact lenses to a patient, we are challenging neural adaptation. Essentially, we see with our, uh, we see with our eyes, but we perceive with our brain. And the brain often com compensates for many inadequacies of the optical system that we have to deal with. And younger patients simply seem to get better adapted. Usually, the typical time taken for neuroadaptation is between three months to one year. It is this failure to neuroadapt which causes uh, uh, discomfort, unhappy patients. The most uh, difficult part is we are not able to predict which of those patients are going to neuroadapt very well and which of those patients are not going to uh, adapt, uh, 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 which are going to adapt poorly. Uh, there have also been some talk about training these patients to adapt to their intraocular lenses, but that is something that has not been widely accepted. So basically, neural adaptation is both the problem and the solution. Both the physician and the patient has to understand this. And just like uh, learning cycling, it's not what the patient gets immediately, but once they try to not to focus on the inadequacies of the lens, but try to enjoy the uh, quality of vision at different distances, you'd find that, and especially if they're bilaterally implanted, the problems tend to go away with. So I think the value of multifocal intraocular lenses far exceeds the temporary discomfort, the short-term dysphotopsia that we, few of the, our patients experience with these lenses. These are just some of my patients who have received multifocal intraocular lenses. I'm not saying I never have a patient, but usually the patient you remember is the one who is not happy with this particular surgery, comes and takes up quite a bit of your chat time, keeps talking to you. I'm sure multiple analyses have been done by people like Dr. Vasavda. We have also done studies on these lenses. What we find is almost 97% of our patients are quite happy with the multifocal lenses, and they say that they would go back to these lenses if they had to choose a lens for their surgery. Even when we were using array multifocal lenses, and Dr. Vasavda used to shy away from those lenses, uh, it was a thesis topic for one of my candidates, 90% of our patients bilaterally implanted were quite happy. And again, today, uh, it's a practice differentiator. Obviously, the lady you are going to remember from this photograph is the, the lady at the back, simply because it's different. So today, the multifocal intraocular lens, historic intraocular lenses allows you to offer something beyond what your peers can offer. Rather, I would encourage the whole community, ophthalmic community, to equip these lenses, to adapting these lenses may be a good idea. The last of my slides, but I almost, uh, or in a talk like this, I always, uh, uh, incorporate this because I feel that this is the most important slide. This is something that has not changed for me for in the last two to two and a half decades. Whenever there's an unhappy multifocal intraocular lens patient, or for that matter, any patient, most often what they are expressing is their concern. It is not a, they are not come to fight with you or be aggressive. Once you agree with them, reassure them. If somebody's multifocal implant patient comes and tells me, I'm seeing glare and halos, I don't immediately get aggressive and say, you're already forewarned, why the hell are you complaining now? I tell them, if you're seeing glare and halos, that means, that's great, that means the lens is working in your eyes. Get the other eye operated, most likely it'll go away. So what they want is reassurance. What they want is uh, the pay, being told that we understand their problem and we have the capability to solve that. And once the, with the right kind of surgical approach, the preoperative approach, post-surgical management, and working hand in hand with these patients, uh, multifocal intraocular lens is something that you can adapt largely. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramamurthy, sir. That was wonderful, wonderful presentation as always. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, Samresh uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Ramamurthy, just stay for a minute. Uh, you you were the pioneer. Uh, before anybody, you started multifocal, and you've been doing your vast experience. If you were to summarize your early 10 years of multifocal practice, and now the last two years, what one or two major things which has changed? Just tell us. There's no better person than you to tell this. I think, uh, yeah, my very approach to uh, multifocal intraocular lenses change. Actually, the time I took up multifocal intraocular lenses and refractive surgery, laser vision correction, almost same, around 1997. And at that point of time, we were not so focused on uh, uh, visual outcomes. Prescribing a minus 2 or a 1.5 diopter spectacles or a cylinder was never a botheration. So, uh, when we started looking at our results of laser vision correction, that's when I started getting interested in accuracy of outcomes and uh, refractive outcomes in cataract patients also. At that time, we didn't have any 
uh, understanding of toric lenses, all these investigative modalities were not there. Uh, getting the patient almost there was quite acceptable, that's what we were able to promise. And we just had a single option intraocular lens that was FDA approved. Today we have multiple options, we understand them much better, we understand why a patient is having a problem and most often we are able to address it. I think it's not the surgical technique that has uh, improved, but it's the pre-surgical evaluation, the post-surgical management, the whole multifocal intraocular lens implantation is a process by itself. It's not just what you do for 8 or 10 minutes under the microscope, it is this uh, understanding which I think has made a huge difference in our outcomes as well as our uh, uh, um, approach to the patient. Thank you so very much, Dr. Amur. Thank you. Uh, very good evening to all the people in the hall. Uh, now that we've heard for the last an hour about different types of IOLs and which patients are the ideal candidates for those lenses, uh, there are certain times when the patients will challenge us and it will sometimes become very difficult for us to find out what, what is the right ideal approach for such patients and what IOLs to be implanted in those cases. And I think I'd just like to bring back uh, what Shail had brought initially with the uh, diagnostics cases, is that of dry eyes. And dry eyes is a big challenge and often goes unnoticed until post-operatively when we land up burning our fingers even after despite performing a good surgery. And that is because of many reasons. The first reason is the irregularity of the diagnostics and the irregularity of the data that comes out of the machines. Like this patient over here, the Mayas are irregular. You would understand that this patient is going to see poorly post-operatively if they have a tear film like this. But it goes on, and obviously post-operatively there are issues of foreign bodies, wound healing issues, potential infections, rehabilitation, so on and so forth. But I think the, one of the biggest concerns is in unreliable biometry. And most often, like Dr. Ramamuthi sir was saying, that it is your lower order Zerni case or your bang on target refraction post-operatively that you have to target. And it becomes a big issue sometimes in dry eye patients because your care readings come out to be wrong in these cases. Just to highlight a case over here, this on the left side is a patient who's had, uh, normally what we do is we do our diagnostics as the first thing. So when the patient comes on a dedicated pre-operative time, like Dr. Shail told us, the first thing that we do on the patient is a manual keratometry, the topographies, optical biometry. All the investigations that require the tear film to be in the pristine state. So if at all we do a applanation, we will not want to repeat these tests on the same day and maybe give it a day's time because that is not the natural state of the eye. Now having done the test on the natural uh, tear film of the patient's eye, this was the aberration profile. This is how the corneal topography shows. It's obviously irregular. And this is after 10 minutes of installation of an eye drop. Notice how regular the mayas become. But it doesn't just end here. It translates into a poor versus good vision. And this is the aberration profile or how bad your cornea is when the light goes through that onto your retina. And look at the light, it's scattering in all directions. It's a bizarre aberration pattern because the light is just scattering like a scratched piece of glass. Versus after uh, regularizing the corneal surface, putting a lubricating eye drop, it's just an astigmatism and defocused in the eye. And all the other higher order aberrations or the irregularities have gone off. But it turns into biometry as well. So the same patient, with biometry done, with the natural uh, tear film of the patient's eye, shows us an IOL power of, if you put, put, if you put an Acrosoft lens of a 21 diopter, targeting almost near emetropia. But after stabilizing a tear film, the biometry almost jumps up from there to about a diopter. And one diopter of myopic surprise, one diopter of refractive error post-operatively is a big embarrassment to the doctor and to the institution because now you're targeting emetropia and we're discussing 0.5 cylinders and to have a refraction like this post-operatively can become a very nagging issue post-operatively. So it's important now all the more for all of us, whether we are in our early practice and learning FACO or we have established ourselves as premium surgeons, to look at the tear film and have at least one sort of an analysis tool. There is no need for an automated analysis tool. If you have a topography, I would urge and we've shifted into our hospital to seeing the raw data or the myers of a topography. Normally what we get is a scan that comes from a printer because our technician has captured the data. But if we just get the print raw data or if we get the myers and we make out that these myers are not right, we can pick up a dry eye patient quite fast and maybe these patients will uh, get better with tear substitution in time. And th that is, I think that's a choice that's left to an individual on what tear substitution to use. But uh, going on from dry eyes to corneal astigmatism, and I think uh, we've de um, Chair has explained beautifully how uh, astigmatism can nearly be completely tackled using the beauty of toric IOLs. And if not objectively, because you might still end up with a 0.5 or more refraction post-operatively, subjectively these patients are very happy. But all that stands true for regular astigmatism, like he said. It is the irregular astigmatism where you do not want to put a toric IOL because irregular astigmatism is not treatable at a, con at a, con at a lens plane. Because irregular astigmatism not only induces astigmatism, it also induces other aberrations like coma, so on and so forth. 
And a glorious example of this is pterygiums, which is extremely prevalent in our country and it's, a, it's there everywhere. A pterygium not only grows on the cornea, but as it dries up, it just drags the cornea on one side. So one side of the cornea turns flat because it's pulled on one side. The other side of the cornea bumps up because it's steep and you have a bad coma aberration that arises. And coma is the worst of all the aberrations because it is not correctable at any plane with anything at all because the whole visual axis is not tilted and it's not in the same axis. And notice on this patient over here, there is a com there's, there is aberration profile. There is irregular astigmatism, as you can make out in the cornea over here. The astigmatism is irregular. There's coma, there's trefoil, and you can make out half the myers are missing over here. Now, this is not an ideal candidate for a toric IOL because the cornea is bumped up in one side. If you were to do a pterygium excision with whatever technique is comfortable, we did it with a conjunctival autograft, and uh, Dr. Vandana in our hospital does these surgeries. Notice how it happens to the astigmatic profile or the aberration profile. This is preoperatively. This is post pterygium excision. The entire coma becomes an astigmatism. The cornea is now a regular astigmatism. And within the pupillary area, the mesopic pupillary area, it's a regular astigmatism. Now, this is a patient that is treatable with the toric IOL quite easily because it's a very regular case situation right now over here. So this goes to this, and this is a treatable situation. This patient underwent a toric IOL. Then needless to say, the patient was extremely happy. Although the patient was thoroughly counseled for post-operative surface symptoms because surface was irregular and it would take a long time for the symptoms to settle down, the patient was very happy with the good unaided vision because we were able to manage the problem. But we did it in a two-step fashion. So although we used the toric IOL, we first tackled the regular cornea, made it regular, and then went ahead with the IOL implant. Similar case situation of an elder, relatively elderly gentleman with cataracts with the right eye has always been weaker and this is what the right eye looks like. Now for all the refractory bent people over here you would understand that this is some sort of a marginal degeneration uh, like a crab claw appearance and this is an irregular cornea and dictum says do not put a toric eye oil in this patient because this is an irregular cornea and I think that's quite right. This is a seven diopter of astigmatism in the eye. If you, if you do a cataract surgery in this patient and leave such much of astigmatism in the eye, it is as good as not operating the patient because the visual quality is still going to be as bad. But what is very important is to understand that when you do your investigations, when I do my investigations, on any investigation for that matter, even if it's an autorefractor, if it's a topography, biometry, I do it in a dimly lit room. As dimly lit as possible because it is this mesopic pupil or the dim lighted pupil that I want to capture the data in. Because in bright light conditions, all of us, we are all ophthalmologists, we know we have pinhole effect and we see quite decently in a bright lighted condition. All the problems start surfacing post-operatively in a dimly lit condition. Night driving is the issue, uh, reading the menu cards is an issue in dim lighting condition, watching, uh, climbing down the stairs is an issue and you want to tackle this. This is the patient's mesopic pupil. And if you were to just zone out all the extra information, in this mesopic pupillary zone, the astigmatism is a fairly regular astigmatism. All the chatter and all the irregularity is lying in this area, which the patient is not using. This cornea is not being used by the patient to see. So in essence, you could put a toric IOL in this patient, so long as you understand, using a topography, I think that's the only way to find out whether the cornea is regular inside the pupillary area. And this is a very regular cornea. This is what the patient sees because of his astigmatism. And although we do underst understand that there are varieties of toric IOLs available, our pre my preference here would be a toric IOL or with the access of toric IOL for many reasons, including biocompatibility, stability, and so forth. And with the maximum dioptric power available, uh, we anticipated a residual of about 1.5 diopters of astigmatism in the patient, and he was counseled for that. But the good part is that with this cylinder, the patient was extremely happy. And this patient has never seen this well with this eye before. Which goes on to say that you can use these IOLs, select the patient right, look at the diagnostics, see what you're treating, and then these IOLs can be used quite advantageously in these patients as well. Another case scenario, uh, this, is just to show, sorry, this is just to show you how a best practical corrected vision of the patient is post-operatively, and it's fairly decent vision. Compared to a seven-cylinder going down to one and a half is giving a new breath of life to the eye. And so toric IOLs can be implanted in these eyes. Another uh, case scenario that's turning up more and more in our clinics now is post-refractive surgery corneas and the older lasers would do more flattening, the newer lasers do, do less and they are more aspheric. But having said and done all that, post-refractive corneas do have a certain aberration or irregular profile uh, which does impose certain challenges during cataract surgery. Of the many issues, the biggest issue is IOL selection, uh, calculation of the IOL, post-operative issues of tackling glare, glare, halo, surface symptoms in cases with uh, dry eyes and so on and so forth. But the biggest problem is because of change in aspheracity of the cornea. It is because the cornea has been touched, there is laser being done, the shape has been altered and that is why sometimes it becomes a challenge uh, post-operatively. I think before, uh, before we uh, go ahead with the IOL power calculation, it's important we understand that this is how normal cornea looks, it's a prolate cornea. And a normal cornea has positive spherical aberrations that we've all heard. We have about a 0.27 uh, 
plus minus uh, uh, 10 uh, range, it, it has a positive spherical aberration. But you want to do a myopic LASIK, which means you're going to flatten the center of the cornea and obviously uh, pump up the periphery, you're going to increase the positive spherical aberrations in the eye. So what was the cornea was there, what the cornea turns out over here. And this positive spherical aberration will start manifesting as glare and halos post-operatively in the patient's eye. Normally in a patient, we, would, uh, we have a choice of lenses available. In a normal patient, when we look at the lens choices, we have a negatively aspheric IOL, we have a partly negative aspheric IOL, we have an aspheric neutral IOL. But I think all that becomes extremely more important in a post-myopic LASIK because now you've increased uh, positive spherical aberrations in the patient's eye. So I think it's a good idea that if you can document the patient's spherical aberrations, put the highest negative aspheric IOL that is available to you in the market. If you do not know it, then use the IOL of your choice, but do understand that these patients will complain of glare and heroes post-operatively. Hyperopic LASIK works in the exact opposite. So you do a laser in the mid-peripheral area. So you steepen the central cornea and the mid-peripheral cornea flattens back. So you land up with a cornea that goes up ahead like a cone and you have more negative spherical aberrations. And I think this is the challenging situation. And these are the patients, patients who've had hyperopic LASIK. You do not want to put a negatively aspheric IOL. It's best to put either a traditional spheric IOL or a neutral IOL. And you don't want to play with asphericity in these patients particularly because they already have uh, uh, visual issues and they are the ones who will complain more and more. So it's best to put a neutral uh, spherical aberration IOL in this patient. But uh, all these things come into effect only when your lower order Zernike is or your myopia and your astigmatism have been tackled right. So I think IOL power calculation in these becomes very important. Uh, there are lots of web-based IOL calculators available, like the uh, one that's available by Dr. Douglas Koch and the group at the ACS Foundation. Where you input data, it takes data from a lot of diagnostics. You put up as much data as is available, and it tells you within range what sort of IOL power will give you what sort of refraction post operatively. But despite such calculators, sometimes it is very important to understand that these patients will still land up with a refractive surprise because of the change in effective lens position. The corneas become flattened and, the, and there are the limitations to IOL power calculations in such eyes. So it's a very good idea to counsel these patients no matter what and avoid multifocal IOLs if the corneas are uh, heavily ablated, which means your post-op keratometry readings have become very flat or very steep. But also if your corneas are irregular like this, Previous LASIKs have had small zone ablations. So you treat the central small zone of the cornea, and if this small zone is decentered, now you see this dot over here, this is the patient's mesopic pupil. And in the patient's mesopic pupil, this is the flatter zone, this is the steeper zone. So the cornea is irregular. And as I said, you have to watch out for coma. Co you don't need an aberrometer to look for coma. All the topographies have Zernikes, and you can just open up the Zernike nomogram and see if the cornea has a significant coma, you can't treat it with an advanced technology IOL, and these, lens, these patients are best left alone with the standard IOLs. Before I go to anything else, just to highlight the importance of pupil in choosing the IOL, this is just to show you how a how patient would see, this is the patient's simulated visual acuity, his point spread function, and his higher order aberration profile in a small pupil or a bright light afternoon pupil. And this is what happens as the patient walks into a dim lighting condition. As more and more pupils opens up, more and more cornea and lens open up, more and more irregularities of the natural system of the eye opens up and the vision starts to deteriorate. So what started as a healthy 6-6 vision over here becomes a blurry 636 vision, 660 vision in a dim lighting condition. So you want to understand the patient's mesopic pupil and all we have to do is just turn off the lights in the diagnostic room and we can understand what the patient's pupil is. So if your mesopic pupil in the patient turns out to be like this, you can put any lens. You can put a positive spherical lens, you can put a negative aspheric lens, it will not matter because the lens is only not going to open up. So you're going to see from the center of the lens and everything is good. But if your pupil opens up to 7 millimeters, you want to choose your lens right. Another case scenario. Okay. Just the last case scenario of a subluxated lens. Uh, if you notice how a subluxated lens, uh, we would tend to wait on to such, with such lenses with an early subluxation which is not even visible clinically. Uh, but only after dilating we can make out that the lens is subluxated over here. But when we do an aberrometry, we find out that the total aberration profile is showing severe, significant aberrations, coma, trefoil, everything, and all of that is arising from the inside of the eye or the lens in the eye, which is tilting. It is the tilt in the lens which is causing this aberration profile. Uh, this, just to show you an animation of how a lens, when lens decenters, it induces higher order aberrations. Uh, depending on the surgical choice and strategy which is comfortable to the surgeon, we would uh, prefer to use a Sioni ring with an in-the-bag IOL implant if it's possible. But we've now stopped putting an aspheric lens in places where we can feel that the IOL might decenter post-operatively because an aspheric lens when it decenters in the visual axis causes more blurring than, a, than would a normal spherical lens. And particularly even if you do a good surgery and you can preserve the capsular bag, I would uh, urge you to not put an aspheric lens in the eye because the moment the aspheric lens goes off the visual axis, it causes more problems. I think with that, I'd like to conclude my talk on special situations. Thank you.
I have a question. You said the pterygium you showed wonderful. Do you recommend two-stage approach? Uh, because it's appealing for the patient that both pterygium and cataract done at the same time. Yeah, I thought you recommend two separately, and it yeah. looks sense to me. So, what's your? No, I think that's a great question. So, because I think uh, when you're tackling two independent issues, pterygium uh, is going to cause irregularity of the cornea. Cataract surgery is just to remove the lens. So once you do a pterygium surgery and you want the cornea to stabilize, you want the TFM to stabilize, but more importantly, you want the keratometry readings to stabilize so we can get the right IOL power calculation and get the right post-operative spherical uh, profile. So I think it's the best idea to give at least a three-month gap, cataract permitting, if it's not a mature or a hyper-mature cataract, to give at least a two to three-month gap between the pterygium surgery done first and a, cor and a cataract surgery done later. Would you recommend, based on what you told us, the pre-operative and post-operative period, tear substitutes as a routine in a pre-operative before you work up? For all the patients? Yes. No, well, I would not. Your, uh, so that, that's again a good question and uh, I think we've done that also. We've used tear substitutes for a while, but artificial tear substitution immediately before doing a procedure. Suppose you put a drop of lubricating and a thick lubricating eye drop and you do a biometry reading or you do a topography reading, the K readings can sometimes come out wrong because the tear film is thickened up. So you want to wait for 10-15 minutes and stabilize the tear film before you uh, would do. But I think it's a good idea to not put any lubricating and look at the natural pristine condition of the patient's cornea first. And then if the readings are really not coming, maybe substitute, give it time and then do a reading again. And finally, what about this angle alpha and kappa? I get confused. Which one is important and what do we actually measure? Why? So, uh, again, uh, this is uh, new. The angle, angle alpha, it's very important to understand that of the many axes inside the eye, there is an anatomical axis, which is the center of the eye that goes to the center of the cornea, the center of the capsular bag and goes straight in the center of the eye. That's the anatomical axis. So when you do a cataract surgery, your lens is going to go into the anatomical center of the eye. Then there is a visual axis, which may not necessarily coincide with the anatomical axis. So if you, there is the distance between the visual axis and the anatomical axis on the corneal surface in millimeters is angle alpha. And it's important because if your angle alpha is large, like Shell showed and Dr. Ramamurthy emphasized, you're going to go on the side of the lens because the lens is in the center of the eye, but you're seeing from the side of the lens. And these patients with particularly multifocal eye wells will have issues because they're seeing from the edges of the rings. Angle kappa is the center of the pupil versus the center of the uh, center of vision, and it's a surrogate marker. But I think of both angle alpha is the more important. Thanks, Amrish, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I'd like to thank all the audience for staying back and uh, thanks to uh, all the speakers as well. Uh, thank you very much. We conclude the session here. Thank you.